Let's stand together. Michelle's going to read the scripture in Matthew 19 for us. Uh, Matthew 19, 16 to 30. The ri- Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your mother and father and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first." Amen. That's the word of the Lord. You may be seated. You know, turn on my head, Mike. Great. Praise the Lord. It's uh, it's good to go through the Gospels together and to study the sayings, the teachings, the life of Jesus, the encounters that he had, so powerful. And here is this encounter with this rich, young ruler and uh, we, we see in Matthew's text that he's young. Verse 22 says that. This is also in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's Gospel, it says he was a ruler. A ruler came to Jesus. In all three of those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says he was rich. So that's where you get that he's rich, he's young, this account in Matthew, and he's a ruler in Luke's account. So he's the rich, young ruler. And that's what the world would really um, want to be, isn't it? I mean, if you want to be somebody, you want to be rich, you want to be young, and you want to be ruling to some degree. And uh, I asked my daughter yesterday, I said, who would be a rich, young ruler today, you know? And uh, Elon Musk, no, too old, too old already. You know, Zuckerberg, I guess, maybe he's kind of a rich young ruler, you know. Prince Harry, I guess he's a rich young ruler or something like this. You know, you think about this concept, and it's someone who who has everything in the world that they could need or want, so to speak. And, and people would look at him and think, this man has everything. You know, can't wait for him to be one of the 12 disciples. You know, he's going to get us into the best places He's going to uh, command respect and so forth. And boy, we're sure going to have some better meals uh, and everything. This guy has it all. And yet there's something certainly that he does not have. And so he's seeking that. And he comes to Jesus looking for something that his heart desires. And he's seeking Jesus not to find that answer in Jesus, but that Jesus might be a good teacher for him and guide him. And point him in the right direction. Give him some instruction on on, on how he might get that which he is looking for. And so this question in verse 16, behold, one came to him and said, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What is this that he doesn't have and that he wants? It's eternal life. He is not sure. He's not confident. 
He, he does not believe that he has eternal life guaranteed to him, and so he is looking for that and desires that. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says that God, he has put eternity in their hearts, and that is the hearts of mankind. God has put eternity in your heart, in my heart, in everyone's hearts. And that longing and desire to have eternity is innate. It's within your nature. It's within your desire because we are not mere mortals, but immortals in the sense that you have a soul. Now, our body is definitely mortal, and that came with the curse, with the fall. And the body will die, but once the body dies, what occurs then? And many people want to know what happens once we die. Is that it? Are we just a bag of material, you know, the net worth is of, of your chemical structure is like $1.30 and on the rise because of inflation maybe, uh, and so forth, like, or is there much more? And definitely there's much more. How many out-of-body experiences have people had? How many times have people physically died and yet they're still tethered somehow to their body and their soul experiences something and they go back into their body and so forth, or that uh, that cord does separate. Uh, many, many, many accounts of that. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says, many who sleep in the dust of the earth, from dust you came to dust you return, your physical body. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Everyone will rise from the dead. Everyone. Some will rise to everlasting life, eternal life. Others will rise, the second category, to everlasting contempt. And this desire for eternal life is within us. C.S. Lewis, I'm not going to quote him perfectly. I don't have it written down. But he said something like, if, if you have the desire for that, then that must be a reality. There must be an eternal life to have that is beyond the grave. So everyone's heart has this need, has this desire. And I would say it's a need because life isn't just a desire. Life is a need. Because if you don't have life, you're dead. So some of the things that you need, you need water. Why? So you can live, so you can have life. You need food. Why? So you can live, you can have life. And you had life yesterday. And you desired life the following day, which is now today. You desire life tomorrow. Now you just extend that out, and that's eternal life, isn't it? It's just life that continues. To have continuous life, that's a desire in our hearts. Now we don't want continuous life to be something entirely like it is now because we don't enjoy the pain, we don't enjoy the corruption, we don't enjoy the decay, we don't enjoy the suffering. We don't enjoy the heartache, but we want eternal life without those things. We are created in, as body, soul, and spirit. And last week, we looked at God's forever family. God's forever family, forever. This idea of an unbroken, eternal life. And I am always amazed at the amount of people who aren't pursuing wholeheartedly how to receive eternal life. I'm amazed at the, not so-called, but the apparent apathy and disinterest in the things of God and eternal life. Personally, on my heart, I was on a drive to know why I existed, what am I doing here, what's it all about, there must be a reason, M must be a much better reason than having fun on the weekend, feeding my flesh, must be, a, must be a much better reason for my life than just working a job and then retiring. There has to be something more. And that desire is within every heart. And I think many people have numbed it. They've put it to sleep. Our culture has done so, the entertainment just consistently washing in the mind so it doesn't pay attention to the reality of the need that is in every single heart. The Lord is calling you. 
He's, he, <laughs> he wants your attention. But really, through our hearts, through our spirit, right? He has put eternity in their hearts, in your heart. And, and I'm glad we're here. I'm glad that we are desiring. And as, as we go out in our city in Victoria, we go wherever, pray that for people. Awaken the hearts. They're longing for this. They're desiring this. They need, this is the greatest need, the greatest need. But how does one become sure and know that they have eternal life? We all desire it, and this rich young ruler desired it, but how does a person get it? That's our question. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would quicken us, awaken, and stir our spirits. I pray that every believer would be built up in our confidence that this is eternal life to know you, the one you sent, God, our Savior Jesus, that you became a man, you died, and you rose again, that you might give us a righteousness we could never earn, we could never deserve, and you would take our sin and remove that from us by taking it to the cross, paying that exceedingly great penalty we could never pay, that you would build in us that confidence that we have eternal life in you, and we know it. And I pray for everyone that is not a believer in Jesus, that they would have conviction that they need you. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you that you are the door. I thank you that you're the answer, and I thank you that you've done the work. Bless your family today, your body. We thank you for being a good father this Father's Day, the best one ever. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, God. In your name we pray, amen. So he's rich, he's young, he's a ruler. We've got these descriptions of his worldly state, this rich young ruler, right? He has it all. He has everything the world wants. People would look at him and say he's got it. But then here is one description of an inner seeking that he has, something he doesn't have. No one would look at him and be like, oh, he doesn't have this. We need to be aware when we're in this world that, hey, this is something that is the great leveler. You know, everybody is broken. No matter what their exterior position looks like, everybody is in a sad state and everybody needs a savior. That's the same across the board, right? So here's this guy with an outer appearance, an outer condition like he has it all. But here is this need he has for eternal life. And just like there are two families, two destinations, everybody in the house and the family of Jesus, born of Jesus, inherits eternal life. And everybody that is not in Christ, they remain in Adam's house. And they keep their sin and are accountable for it, and they will inherit eternal contempt. Now, this rich young ruler, we'll just RYR, maybe Ryrie, I don't know. Um, this guy here, he knows he doesn't have it, and so he says, good teacher, what must I do that I may have eternal life? In the ESV, it's teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? In Luke's gospel, in Luke 18, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, the onus and the activity is all on him in this picture. That all of his thoughts are that eternal life must be something I need to do in order to get it. That it's acquired through my effort. So, Good teacher, what must I do to have or inherit? What good deed must I do? And Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Now, Jesus and his goodness isn't in question here. But Jesus is questioning the RYR's very concept of goodness. He's, he's really putting into question what is your idea of goodness? Because you call me good, and he is good. Jesus is the only one who can truly be called good. And you're asking, what good thing should I do that I can inherit it? Do you understand what you're saying? 
I think Jesus is exposing something right away and really rebuking in this idea and this concept. Because in, in the King James, by the way, it says, good teacher, what good thing must I do? How good does a person need to be to get a pass for eternal life? Where is that bar? And you're like, okay, you get to pass, you don't pass, and so forth. You know, the greatest religion in the world, and, and Lloyd, I'm not sure you knew what I was teaching at all today, but when he gave the uh, prayer to open our time together, he prayed that there's only two religions in the world. I don't know if you heard that. And he prayed that, and I thought, wow, it's good works or it's Jesus. And you do, do you know what the greatest religion in the world is? It's meism. That's it. That's the greatest religion in the world by far. It, it, what do people believe in? What do people trust in? What do people put their stock in at the end of the day? Themselves. That's the majority of the world by and large. Most all religions support that desire because pride is this monster within. And, and we all want to feel good about what we've done in these things. But all the religions basically say, here's what you have to do. Even if it's you need to absolve yourself into the nothingness. Like you have to do, you have to do, you have to do, you have to acquire, you have to measure, you have to do all of these things. And in the modality of it all is you and your good works. You can ask someone in Islam, what if I wanted to become a Muslim and I die and I meet Allah, what would be the requirement of whether or not I get to go into this, you know, eternal life of their design, their thinking? And they're going to have a hard time telling you. Ultimately, it's good works. And they're not even sure they'll get in. That's why jihad's a popular thing. You're still not even guaranteed it then. But it's, you need to do these things. And, and ultimately, people just think, be a good person. But if you died and you faced God, if you died tonight, God asks, why should I let you into my heaven? What do you say? What do most people say? Right? We, we hopefully we say because the gospel of what you've done, et cetera, I've trusted in you. But the majority of the response of people, what do you think they would say? I'm a, I'm, I've, I've tried to be a good person. I'm not perfect, but they would, they would refer to being a good person or their intentionality. I've meant well, or I didn't know, or something. I've tried to do my best. Well, how good does one need to be to inherit eternal life? What is the passing grade? How well-intentioned? You got to be somewhat well-intentioned? Mostly well-intentioned? Like all the time well-intentioned? And be like, I'm well-intentioned all the time. Well, you just failed because you're proud or something, you know? And you've got, if you think about the idea of karma, this one always gets me. Karma is you're reaping what you're sowing. You know, you've, you've planted that seed, you get that in your next life, and this idea of reincarnation. And really, the idea of reincarnation, which is a false concept, um, is that you get another chance at being good enough. And it's this continuous cycle that you weren't good enough last time. I don't even know what happened last time. You know, and now this round, you get to do a little more. Oh, good. And, and whatever you did that was bad in the last round, someone needs to do that to you in this round because you need to get what you deserved, et cetera. Oh, that means they did, they're doing something bad, so then their next round, someone needs to do something bad to them, and then their next round, someone needs to do something bad to them. It's craziness. Until you reach a nothingness? You know, Jesus is basically going to test him, and he's going to say, if you want to play this game, if you want to inherit eternal life by the things you do, then, okay, keep the commandments. And he says that to him here, 
Why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus isn't giving a, a, everybody the instruction. This is how you get eternal life. Keep the commandments. He's according to the idea that you can inherit eternal life by the things you do. Okay, then, here's the standard. Here is a measuring line. Here is the rule. And you need to keep the commandments. Because God had given has many commandments in the scriptures, right? And, and it's not just Hinduism that's based on good works. It's, it's all of them. At the end of the day, it's save yourself. And it's, again, me-ism. And so here, this guy enters into that, but he has a biblical mindset to a degree. He understood when Jesus said, keep the commandments, he had a reference point. He's a good Jewish, rich, young ruler. And he believes in his goodness. And so Jesus points him to that standard of the commandments. Now, of course, it's the Ten Commandments he's referring to out of Exodus chapter 20. But start there. And the Ten Commandments, if you didn't know this, are really in two parts. And you've got six on one side and you've got four on the other. And the first four are about God. Worshiping the Lord your God only, making no graven images, don't take his uh, name in vain, and take his rest into your life. And then the next six, from honoring forward to coveting, are about others. So the first four, the first tablet, if you want to say it that way, are about loving God with all your heart. The next tablet is about loving your neighbor as you would love yourself. You don't hate yourself. You take care of yourself every day, you know, and uh, loving others. So loving God and loving others, and that's the sum of the law. So Jesus takes him to the others part. doesn't even talk about the first four there. And Really, Jesus gave him a sharp response. Why do you call me good? Why are you calling me good? You want to be good enough to inherit eternal life? Okay, start keeping the commandments. Because if you could keep all of God's commandments perfectly, wouldn't you be righteous? If a person could, 100% of the time, 100% obey and, and love God and love their neighbor without ever, ever slipping, would that not be righteousness? Indeed, I think it would be. And Jesus is the one, of course, who fulfills all righteousness, for he never sinned. He never missed the mark of perfection. Yet, we know we have. So keep the commandments. And I love what this guy says now. Okay, verse 18, he said to him, which ones? Which ones? The commandments. Which ones? And don't we do that? We pick and we choose. It's build a bear religion. You know, you get to, oh, I like the fluffy one. You know, I like that one. I like this one. And, and, and most people will pick and choose and tailor it to what we want. And of course, we're going to choose commands, religion. And this happens within Christianity so to degrees, doesn't it? We're going to pick and choose and make a God in our image. Be like, well, I'm kind of good at these ones. The, the ones I'm not good at, no, no, no. You know, I like health and wealth. Therefore, thou shalt not covet. Let's not talk about that one. Interesting, in Roman Catholicism, they take not, commandment 9 and 10 and put them together, and they erase commandment 2, don't make idols. It's really weird. Their, their list of Ten Commandments is different than the Protestant list of Ten Commandments. Interesting. Because they, they blend two and then hide one. Because, you know, which ones? Which ones? Choose a religion. Choose a religion that makes you feel least guilty and least accountable. And I'm... I'm I'm, I shouldn't be amazed at his, his ask here of Jesus in verse 18, which ones? So Jesus is like, which ones? Okay. And uh, two weeks ago when Emmanuel was sharing in church history on Wednesday night, 
you mentioned 613 tassels on the robe. So you could count all the commandments. Amazing. The, the studiousness, the intense seriousness. No wonder they, you know, will spit at a dirty Gentile and, you know, scorn in these things on the bus or wherever else in Israel to this day. Like, it, it, they, they, they're so focused on being good according to some far out standard. Now, Jesus says, okay, murder, adultery, steal, bearing false witness, slandering or gossiping or lying about others, honoring your father and mother, verse 19. That's commandment five. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He's summing up loving your neighbor, the others section of the Ten Commandments. And he says, okay, start with these, start with these five. Now, again, in the second section of the Ten Commandments, if you put it into two sections, God and others, he gives him five of the six. And he gives him number five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, did I do that right? Five, six, seven, eight, and nine. He gives him five of the six. And so he responds, and Jesus, of course, knowing the heart, knew that this would be the case. Verse 20, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? I've done it. Uh, number five, check. Honor my father and mother. Six, check. Seven, check. Eight, nine, check, 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 check. He's batting a thousand. You know, he's a good guy. He's done it. And he says, what else do I lack? Now, that's interesting because here is someone who has aspired to be a good person, to live by the law, to do things right, feels very good about himself, and yet he is aware down deep in his heart that he still lacks. He's aware that he still lacks. And we can be religious. Someone can be uh, in, a, in a way where they have convinced themselves that they're a good person. They've done the right things. And you look down on everyone else because they just don't do it enough. But that awareness of lacking, God uses that to leverage reality into our life because we all lack, we have all sinned. And even here, something is still lacking. The fact that, that he is aware that there's a lack tells you there's definitely a lack. And I'm glad he's seeking in the sense where I said earlier, many people I feel like aren't seeking. I don't get it. I don't get why people seem to be content with not knowing what will happen when they die. I'm saddened by the fact that gravestones aren't put up much around us, that you can order a hamburger and never see the bloody death of the animal, that death and, and the reality of it is put away from us in our affluent society. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to go there. We don't want to talk about it. And I think that's all part of the game to try to make us less interested in the need for eternal life. So this guy's done it all, and Jesus already touched on the concept of being good, but now is going to totally expose him. He doesn't charge him with those things and dig in deeper. Really, did you ever take anything, anything? Like that day you took the pen from that office and it wasn't yours to take? That's stealing. Did you ever look at a woman in lust? That's adultery in the heart and so on and so forth. But Jesus uh, knew something about this young man, of course, and takes it on in verse 21. What do you still lack? Oh, he left out a command, see? He gave him five of the six of the loving one another, and he left out number 10, which is you shall not covet. And he says to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. If you want to be complete, do this. Now, Jesus definitely agrees, yes, you are lacking. 
Yes, you do lack. And you lack in this area most definitely. Now, of course, the man would have lacked in all of them. But here, when someone lacks, they're, they're missing something in their life, aren't they? The sick need to be healed. And here is the physician exposing that there is a darkness and a lack in his life. And there's corruption within. He's not unloving the rich young ruler. In the Gospel of Mark, it says Jesus looked at him and had compassion on him and said. He loved him. He looked at him. He didn't come down on him like, you proud, arrogant, you know, uh, Pharisee, religious, etc. No, he's, he looked at him and he loved him. And he's loving him by exposing this reality in his life. And the Ten Commandments, by the way, are not even close to all of the commandments. But in essence, of course, it's loving God and loving one another. So if you want to be judged on your goodness by the Ten Commandments, how would you stand up? How would you stand up? You know, I, I, I memorized the Ten Commandments, and I used my fingers because I've got ten fingers. And I... I thought, you know, I think maybe God gave me 10 fingers so I could count all the commands I've broken. And as I memorize, I go, I've broken it. 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 And I could just do that all day long. And I've broken the commands over and over and over and over. And I'm not striving to live up to the Ten Commandments. I need a change of heart. I need Christ in me, the hope of glory. I need to know the Lord. I need a new heart. I will take the stony heart out of you and put within you a heart of flesh and cause you to keep my commandments, that your heart would be in line with God's heart. And the nature changes from the inside out. I have failed to love God with all of my heart, my soul, my strength. I have failed to love God with all of my emotion, all of my feelings, all of my thoughts, my mind, with all of my physical efforts. No, I love myself most of the time, the majority of the time. I have failed to love others as much as I love myself. I serve myself way more than I serve others. Way more. And care for myself first. And if I was really measured up, be like, yeah, Cameron, you put yourself first. All the time. Have you loved God with all of your heart? Have you loved God with all of your mind? Have you loved God with all of your thoughts? That's a, that's a very, very high. Jesus didn't go there with him. So failed in every point. And if the Lord were to keep a record of wrongs, who would stand? Who would stand? Sinners all. And the law has done what? Condemned all under sin. It's condemned all as unrighteous. So the law wasn't given for a measure to rise up to. The law was given as a mirror, right? Revealing the weakness and the sin. And and you know what? Here's what love does. You could go to the bay downtown, and you can go into the um, cosmetic department, and the floor is what? It's white. And the counters are, well, they're white. And there's mirrors and glass. And then you sit down, you know, I've never done this, but you sit down there and they've got those uh, cosmetic mirrors, right? And they've got lights around the whole circumference. There's more light. And you could sit on that stool and they could be like, well, you need some makeup. (laughs) You need to buy this. They're like, and someone's like, no, I look pretty good. And they're like, oh, let me turn the light up. Turn that light up. You're like, oh, we got a, we got one on the hook. 
You need, you know, you need some of this product. You need some of that product. Love puts a spotlight on the soul that exposes it all. Because even if you were trying to do good things, love wasn't the motive, then you were doing it for the wrong reason and intention and so forth to begin with. And the law just wrecks us and reveals how dirty we are. And love, again, reveals like you've got not enough makeup can ever hide the reality of what's going on inside of the human soul. And when you measure against true holiness, when you measure against real love, the love of God, not a false understanding of it and the false definitions of it, then you will definitely understand that you are not good. That, like Romans 3 speaks of, that your mouth is an open tomb. It reveals that inside there's just death. The law does not improve me. It reproves me. It condemns me and does the same for you. And that's religiosity as well. I'm a good person because I went to church. I'm a good person because, you know, hereditary, Al, you mentioned. Righteousness is not hereditary. Right. And so the message is not that the rich young ruler wasn't willing to do more. And that is a a popular teaching in some circles, by the way, with some very popular teachers that I'm not going to name. Uh, I read a large book on this concept. It's called Lordship Salvation. And the idea is, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And I understand the difference of him being my Savior and my Lord. He's my Savior because he saves me from myself and my sin. And he's increasingly, continuously, progressively being Lord of my life. But the idea of Lordship Salvation is essentially, if you're not willing to give up everything, you can't be saved. The challenge with that is now the exchange is your absolute surrender and willingness to give all. In exchange, God will give you salvation. Wait a second. I thought Jesus gave all. I thought Jesus died. I thought Jesus paid the price and rose from the dead in order so that I could have salvation by grace, not by my ability to completely surrender. Because if it's by my ability to completely surrender, I am damned. I will not make the grade. I I am unable to completely, 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 completely surrender. And every day pretty much proves that to me. When my thoughts go astray, when my heart wanders, when when I won't sacrifice for others, I don't sit there in a condemned pile, woe is me, I just need to look again to Jesus. And in looking to Jesus, I find that hope, I find that encouragement, I find that strength. Jesus doesn't leave us in a state of not changing, not at all. He changes us, he works through us. But um, if, if you want to talk more about lordship salvation, I'm free to talk about that. Ultimately, the idea of a transaction had to occur for our salvation. And if the transaction is 99% Jesus and 1% you, then it's not 100% Jesus. And therefore, not by grace. Therefore, it is by mostly grace with a little bit of your works. A little bit. Now, do we accept Jesus into our life? Do we say yes to, yeah, yeah, we do. But that's not a work. That's just receiving his work. That's yielding to it. It's not do more. This rich young ruler, the reason that he walks away sad is not because he's unwilling to do more. 
The reason this rich young ruler walks away sad is because he will not recognize that he is a broken sinner. He's not coming to terms with the reality of his heart. He's not coming to terms with what Jesus is exposing, that he's broken because he's lived life thinking he's good, he's good, he's good. So what other good things do I need to do? What do I do? Again, the law, Jesus exposes his inability and his unwillingness. And he's guilty. He is corrupt inside where a physician needs a cure or where the guilty need an advocate and a pardon. When the commandments are broken, they are what? Those, when someone breaks the law, that is a crime. God is eternal, and his character creates his reality. So the reason something is wrong is because that is against the very nature of God. It's not because someone just said so. Well, I just said so arbitrarily. No, it's wrong because God is good, because God gives. That's why that's wrong, because God is a life giver. Murder and taking, it's wrong, etc. So you're, a person's really cr- making their criminal account so big. It's countless spiritual crimes against a holy God. How many spiritual crimes has someone committed? Innumerable. And the stain of sin runs so deep inside the soul, mind, and out through the acts that it, it eventually it does definitely expose what's deep within. And so it's not he hasn't done enough and he needs to do more. That's the same as all the other meism that's out there. And this text does get misapplied. And if RYR was willing to give all away, could he then prove himself to be good enough? Oh, wow. So Jesus is perfect, but so was this guy. You know, Jesus didn't have to die for him, etc. So this man struggled to hear this because he had many possessions and You know, his identity and his trust and his perceived goodness is a bit tied up into this persona that he's got going on. Having possessions is not wrong. We all have possessions. It's when possessions have you that something's wrong. And if your possessions possess you, then... then It shall not covet. It's opening the hand, opening the heart. And in verse 23, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's hard. It's not impossible. It's just hard. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard. It's difficult. Why? It's difficult because the problem of the heart, and it's, it's where we put our trust. You see, if the problem is just wealth or money or possessions, if that's the problem, you could get you know, rid of that. And, and you know, if everyone then, if that's the problem, if everyone was poor, you would own nothing and be happy? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, the problem is the heart right? Every problem is a problem in the heart. And the heart problem is they're not trusting. Money allows us to feel good about ourselves, allows us, it's like an access. It gives us access to comfort. It gives us access to less pain. It gives us access to um, the persona of other people thinking well of you. Money can, can do a lot of things for you, but it can't save you. And it can trick you into thinking that you've got it, you've got it done. So that's the deception of it. Because our hearts end up trusting in. You know, there's a reason they call uh, finances securities. Because you feel secure. I feel secure now. Now I can rest. Because money has taken care of my anxiety. Money has taken care of my need. So it becomes like a God. 
in that sense. And everyone places their trust in something, somewhere, or ultimately someone. And in that someone, it's either yourself, a false Christ, or Jesus, the Savior. And so they ask, who then can be saved? Who, they're astonished. They're like, if you've got to get a camel through the eye of a needle, who can be saved? You know, uh, how do you, who can do this? And I love Jesus' answer is that, well, with men, it is impossible. It's impossible. Salvation's impossible with men. But with God, all things are possible. You, you can't get a camel through a small space. You can't do it. It's just simple arithmetic. And, but the solution is not addition in your life. Do more, try harder, be better. It's not addition morally. It's not addition religiously. And it's not ad- addition uh, circumstance or materially. The solution is subtraction. Because you're not going to get this giant beast through this small space. More stuff means bigger load. More uh, legalism means you've got more to let go of in your self-righteousness. You see how this works? The door into the kingdom is very, very small. And few find it. But with God, it's possible for someone to enter into the door of eternal life. So Peter answers and says to him, we've left and followed you. We've let go of these things and followed you. Now, Peter was married and he had family to take care of and so forth. He says, we've left this. Therefore, what shall we have? Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you in in the regeneration, the resurrection, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you'll, you have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones. You, they've been faithful, and, and they're learning of Christ, and so forth, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So everyone that follows Jesus needs to leave absolutely everything. You need to leave your wife. That doesn't sound right. You need to leave your kids. You need to leave uh, all your responsibilities and everything else. Is this what he's talking about? He is talking about a leave it all attitude in a way. That we need to let go of, of all of our accumulated interests, all of our idolatry, and we need to Seek first the kingdom of God. And if we have something first above the kingdom of God, that thing that's first needs to be let go. You need to leave it. You need to let it go in your heart so that the Lord is first. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Only if I'm married. Once I'm married, then I'll be happy. You're putting it first. Once I get then I'll, if I move to, then, uh, 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 and we just, our nature is to keep putting it first because we want that security. We want that wholeness. It will only and ever and always be in Jesus. And really, by faith, it's a continuous act of, of surrender, of yielding, of, of letting it go. So, Really, I think that this portion, it's the idea is take it all off of your stinky camel and even kill the camel. And we didn't title today's message, I mean, kill the camel. I was thinking about camels. Uh, They are a beast of burden, a camel. It's a beast of burden. Bears, Bears a burden. It's an unclean animal. So you're not to eat it, right? It, it is, a, a camel is like your best attempt at surviving in the wastelands, in the dry places. 
And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, they won't be coming into the kingdom. Right? U-Hauls don't follow hearses. You can't take it with you. And, And the cares of the world as well, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches won't come through that small door into the kingdom. They're not coming. This beast of burden loaded up. All of our uncleanness won't come in through that door either. No self-righteousness is going to enter in. And our life in this wandering temporary time and space, pilgrims and sojourners as we are, citizens of his kingdom, temporary residents here, is like that camel loaded up in a desert wilderness that we just keep adding it on, adding it on. And there needs to be a leaving it in spirit, a release of the world's hold and its cares. Letting go of everything is not an act of our goodness for salvation. Leaving in spirit and letting go of these things is an act of faith in Christ. And it can only be done that way, truly, by the way. Because if you're looking at Christ and you behold him and his wonder and his goodness and his glory and his love and his completed righteousness and his favor and his sanctification and his redemption, then you have everything. And like Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, you are complete in him, lacking nothing in him. And so letting go of everything is is only going to be truly accomplished by an act of faith in Christ. And you can have peace in your life. Well, you know, I thought I needed that, but I only really wanted that. There's a difference. And I'm complete in Christ. And now I'm finding my interest isn't there so much. Nothing first in my heart that I love You with all my heart, you can tell the Lord, with all my soul, with all my strength. It's all yours, and I'm all yours, and my heart belongs to you. So this rich young ruler, again, he looks like he is first in the world. He looks like he's got it. And and he's a good person who's done a lot of good things, et cetera, et cetera. He's, He's, boy, you would want your daughter to marry him, you know. Who didn't look first like they were first? John the Baptist didn't look like he was first. He didn't look first at all. John the Baptist, did did he have a career or something? Like, what? Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) What What was up with John the Baptist? Jesus said, among those born of women, there was no one greater than John the Baptist. No one greater? Then John the Baptist, among those born of women, the greatest of the prophets. And in verse 30 in Matthew 19, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And that's going to continue in chapter 20, that idea of first and last, last and first. But, you know, with John the Baptist, what was he wearing? Sandals, yes, but what was he clothed in? Oh, a dead camel. He was clothed with dead camel. That's what he was clothed with, camel skin. And he was living in the wilderness. He was clothed with dead camel. And I think about that and I realize, yeah, it's hard for that camel to get through that small space. And you've got to be willing to release all of your vanity and all of your trust and all of these things. And John did it, didn't he? He killed that camel. And then it can go through. All of his trust, all of his security in Christ, in Christ alone. Would you like to know that you have eternal life? Who and where is eternal life found? And Jesus, John 17, 3, this is eternal life to know you, to know the Lord and the one you sent. 
to know Jesus. And to know Jesus is to know also that you have eternal life, that you can have it in Christ. Let's have the worship team come on up here. Let's stand and pray together. Ask the Lord to search our hearts, to help us to let go of anything and everything and just look to him. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't have eternal life. And you need to turn your eyes to him and trust him. You need to realize that like the rest of us, you are a sinner and you're guilty of countless spiritual crimes and you need a savior. And Jesus is that gracious, kind Savior who is the only perfect one who came for us because he loves us. He loves you. And he died for our sins. He rose again the third day. And he's seated in heaven, interceding, praying, and ready to bless. He who, he who knew no sin, the only one, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, not in ourselves. And so it's a message of grace, and it's a good, good, good news for you. Turn your heart and accept the Lord and receive his forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you that you are so good to us that you did it all, not some of it, not most of it, but all of it. We thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price and the penalty was put on your shoulders. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us one and all and that you love those who are trying in themselves to be good, to try hard and to do more and that you would have our hearts turn and find their rest in you. Lord, thank you that it's through this relationship that you help us to grow, you help us to be sanctified and you help us to continue to grow in loving you and loving one another. Lord, I thank you that it's not through my efforts it's not through my wisdom. It's not through my determined obedience, Lord, but through the love of Christ and your spirit working inside the heart. Lord, we thank you for your law. It's good. And it reveals to us our need of our Savior, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to be sanctified by your word. We pray, God, that you would help us to have no gods before you that we would turn everything over and release it into your hands. We love you and we thank you that it is not only, uh, it, that it's possible with you, that you've done the work, that you are the door, and that if we enter in by you, we find life. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.